This is VOA One, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Susan Shand. Dan Friedel, and John Russell. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Susan Shand. The social media site Facebook blocked Australians from sharing news stories on Thursday. The company is fighting with the Australian government over whether big technology companies should have to pay news organizations for their information. Australia's government condemned the move. It said Facebook also blocked some government communications, including messages about emergency services. Facebook acted after the Australian House of Representatives passed legislation that would make it and Google pay for Australian journalism, said Treasurer Josh Frydenberg. He said he was given no warning before Facebook acted. The legislation must be passed by the Senate to become law. Facebook fears that similar legislation will pass in other countries. Governments around the world are changing their laws to have some control over fast-changing technology. Australian news organizations could not put stories online on Thursday. People who tried to share news stories got notes saying they were blocked. This post can't be shared, the website said. In response to Australian government legislation, Facebook restricts the posting of news. It also said that news from Australian publications cannot be shared internationally. The legislation has not yet been passed, the note added. Prime Minister Scott Morrison criticized the company on his own Facebook page. These actions will only confirm the concerns that an increasing number of countries are expressing about the behavior of big tech companies who think they are bigger than governments, he wrote. They may be changing the world, but that doesn't mean they run it, he added. Facebook said the proposed Australian law misunderstands the relationship between our platform and the publishers who use it. The country's health minister, Greg Hunt, also denounced Facebook's decision. He described it to Parliament as an abuse of big technologies, market power, and control over technology. In the past, Google and Facebook had threatened to take strong action if the law appears to be headed for passage. Australia's law would create negotiation committees that would help news organizations work with big technology companies to decide on payment for their news stories. It would stop the technology companies from using their large market share to make take-it-or-leave-it offers. Google had threatened to remove its search abilities from Australia because of the House measure. But instead, Google reached compromises with several companies. News Corp announced a deal with Google on Wednesday. The large Australian news organization Seven West Media made a deal earlier in the week, and another 
Nine Entertainment is reportedly close to its own agreement. The state-owned Australian Broadcasting Corp. is in talks for a deal with Google as well. The government accused Facebook of endangering the public by blocking state emergency services messages. There were severe fire and flood warnings in parts of Australia. Facebook said in a statement that it would look to replace any pages that should not have been removed. Friedenberg said he had constructive discussions with Facebook chief Mark Zuckerberg after the blocking began. He will come back to me with some more considered views, Friedenberg said. He said the government remains supportive of the proposed law because it will pay news organizations for the use of their material. Other countries are watching, Treasurer Friedenberg said. It may currently be very cold in the northern United States, but most of the winter was a little too warm for ice fishing. Scientists are just now able to study the 2021 population of a small fish popular in ice fishing. They are called rainbow smelts. People catch them through small holes dug through the ice surface of a frozen body of water. About 15 years ago, the rainbow smelt population began to drop in the U.S. The government declared them a species of special concern and began researching the fish. Scientists want to find out why. There are many fewer smelt today than in the 1970s and 1980s. Thirty years ago, Fishermen caught millions of kilograms of the fish each year. In 2018, they only caught about 22,000 kilograms. Researchers think climate change, loss of habitat, and overfishing are all involved in the decreasing numbers. Wintry weather came late this year in Maine, where some smelts live. Scientists there could not catch them until early February, when the thick ice finally formed. The lack of ice also stopped sport fishing for smelts, and that hurt businesses linked to the activity. Steve Layton owns Leighton Smelt Camps in Maine. He had trouble making money this winter. I'm just going to try to pay for expenses right now, he said. In Ohio, Tony Musioni helps people catch a type of fish called walleye in Lake Erie each winter. He said he had thought the lake would not ice over this year at all. Now there finally is some thick ice. You've just got to watch where you're going now, he said. Wildlife departments around the northern U.S. have warned fishermen to be careful on the ice. Tom Hawley studies water with the National Weather Service. In Maine, he said, there has been about half the usual amount of ice. Normally, there are about 50 centimeters. That is because January was about 3 degrees Celsius warmer than usual. I'm Dan Friedel. Classic film Star Wars A New Hope has a very famous scene. Actors Mark Hamill and Harrison Ford say the following words. What a piece of junk! She'll make .5 past light speed. She may not look like much, but she's got it where it counts, kid. I've made a lot of special modifications myself. In today's Everyday Grammar, we will explore the grammar behind these famous words. 
Specifically, you will learn how English speakers sometimes use different pronouns when talking about inanimate objects. But first, let's explore some important terms. Animate means alive, particularly in the way that humans or animals are. The term inanimate object means an object that is not alive, such as a rock, a chair, or a spacecraft. English speakers generally use the pronoun it to talk about an object or substance, as in... He saw the guitar and immediately decided to buy it. English speakers also use it to talk about a living thing whose sex is unknown, as in... Someone is at the door. I don't know who it is. But notice how Harrison Ford used the pronoun she to talk about his spacecraft, an inanimate object. She'll make point five past light speed. She may not look like much, but she's got it where it counts, kid. In an unusual turn of events, English speakers sometimes use other pronouns to talk about inanimate objects, usually with the pronoun she. To be clear, this use is not very common. Still, you might hear she when people are talking about objects that are very close to them. For example, it could be an object that a person has worked on or been with for many years. Often, these objects will be large and used for transportation. Cars, ships, boats, and yes, even spacecraft. It would sound strange to talk about a smaller, simpler object with the pronoun she. For example, it would be hard to imagine a speaker of American English using she to talk about a nail or a flower pot. Speakers of different kinds of English refer to inanimate objects in slightly different ways. In a paper on New Zealand English, Lori Bauer notes that she is used to talk about inanimate objects, particularly if the object is a ship, car, or other piece of much-loved machinery. But, Bauer adds, speakers of New Zealand English use she to refer to objects in a way that is different from other kinds of English. One example Bauer gives is, She's a good crash helmet, a statement made in an everyday discussion. Bauer notes that this use also sometimes appears in Australian English. He is careful to add that some kinds of Australian English also use he with a similar meaning. The good news for you is this. You do not need to use the pronoun she in the way that we have discussed today. When you are speaking, you should use the pronoun it when you talk about inanimate objects. This will help you avoid any confusing situations. But understanding how some English speakers use different pronouns can be useful to you, particularly if you are listening to everyday discussions or watching films. The next time you are watching American films, and particularly films about spacecraft, cars, boats, or ships, pay careful attention to the pronouns that the speakers use when they talk about inanimate objects. Over time, you will develop a stronger understanding of the small details in meaning that different pronouns can give. I'm John Russell. Welcome to the Making of a Nation. 
American History in VOA Special English. I'm Steve Ember. History is usually a process of slow change. However, certain events also can change the course of history. Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo was such an event. So was the first airplane flight by the Wright brothers, or the meeting between the Spanish explorer Cortez and the Aztec king Montezuma. All these events were moments that changed history. And so it was, too, with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. The attack also was made on all naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. We take you now to Washington. The details are not available. They will be in a few minutes. The White House is now giving out a statement. The attack apparently was made on all naval and on naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. The president's brief statement was read to reporters by Stephen Early, the president's secretary. A Japanese attack upon Pearl Harbor naturally would mean war. Such an attack would naturally bring a counterattack, and hostilities of this kind would naturally mean that the president would ask Congress for a declaration of war. The surprise attack on America's large naval base in Hawaii was a great military success for Japan. However, the attack on Pearl Harbor had more than a military meaning. The attack would force Americans to enter World War II. More importantly, it would also make them better recognize their position as one of the most powerful nations in the world. In future weeks, we will discuss the military and political events of World War II. But today, we look back at the years before the United States entered that war. The period between the end of World War I and the attack on Pearl Harbor lasted only 23 years, from 1918 to 1941. But those years were filled with important changes in American politics, culture, and traditions. We start our review of these years with politics. In 1920, Americans elected Republican Warren Harding to the presidency. The voters were tired of the progressive policies of Democratic President Woodrow Wilson. They were especially tired of Wilson's desire for the United States to play an active role in the new League of Nations. Harding was a conservative Republican, and so were the two presidents who followed him. Calvin Coolidge and Herbert Hoover. All three of these presidents generally followed conservative economic policies, and they did not take an active part in world affairs. Americans turned away from Republican rule in the election of 1932. They elected the Democratic presidential candidate Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and they continued to re-elect him. In this way, the conservative Republican policies of the 1920s changed to the more progressive policies of Roosevelt in the 1930s. The change happened mainly because of economic troubles. So keep cool, and keep cool, it is the slogan of today. The 1920s were a time of growth and business strength. President Calvin Coolidge said during his term that the chief business of the American people is business. This generally was the same belief of the other Republican presidents during the period, Warren Harding and Herbert Hoover. There was a good reason for this. The economy expanded greatly during the 1920s. Many Americans made a great deal of money on the stock market and wages for workers increased as well.
However, economic growth ended suddenly with the stock market crash of October 1929. In that month, the stocks for many leading companies fell sharply, and they continued to fall in the months that followed. Many Americans lost great amounts of money, and the public at large lost faith in the economy. Soon, the economy was in ruins, and businesses were closing their doors. President Hoover tried to solve the crisis, but he was not willing to take the strong actions that were needed to end it. As time passed, many Americans began to blame Hoover for the terrible economic depression. Democrat Franklin Roosevelt was elected mainly because he promised to try new solutions to end the Great Depression. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. Soon after he was elected, Roosevelt launched a number of imaginative economic policies to solve the crisis. Our greatest primary task is to put people to work. This is no unsolvable problem if we face it wisely and courageously. It can be accomplished in part by direct recruiting by the government itself, treating the task as we would treat the emergency of a war, but at the same time, through this employment, accomplishing great, greatly needed projects to stimulate and reorganize the use of our great natural resources. Hand in hand with that, we must frankly recognize the overbalance of population in our industrial centers and by engaging on a national scale in a redistribution endeavor to provide a better use of the land for those best fitted for the land. Yes, the task can be helped by definite efforts to raise the values of agricultural products and with this the power to purchase the output of our cities. It can be helped by preventing realistically the tragedy of the growing loss through foreclosure of our small homes and our farms. It can be helped by insistence that the federal, the state, and the local governments act forthwith on the demand that their cost be drastically reduced. Roosevelt's policies helped to reduce the amount of human suffering. But the Great Depression finally ended only with America's entry into World War II. Roosevelt's victory in 1932 also helped change the balance of power in American politics. Roosevelt brought new kinds of Americans to positions of power. Labor union leaders... Roman Catholics, Jews, blacks, Americans from families that had come from places such as Italy, Ireland, and Russia. These Americans repaid Roosevelt by giving the Democratic Party their votes. The 1920s and 30s also brought basic changes in how Americans dealt with many of their social and economic problems. The 1920s generally were a period of economic growth with little government intervention in the day-to-day -day lives of the people. But the terrible conditions of the Great Depression during the 1930s forced Roosevelt and the federal government to experiment with new policies. The government began to take an active role in offering relief to the poor, it started programs to give food and money to poor people, and it created jobs for workers. The government grew in other ways. It created major programs for farmers. 
It set regulations for the stock market. It built dams, roads, and airports. American government looked much different at the end of this period between the world wars than it did at the beginning. Government had become larger and more important. It dealt with many more issues in people's lives than it ever had before. Social protest increased during the 1920s and 30s. Some black Americans began to speak out more actively about unfair laws and customs. Blacks in great numbers moved from the southern part of the country to northern and central cities. The 1920s and 30s also were a time of change for women. Women began to wear less conservative kinds of clothes. Washing machines and other inventions allowed them to spend less time doing housework. Women could smoke or drink in public, at least in large cities, and many women held jobs. Of course, the women's movement was not new. Long years of work by such women's leaders as Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony had helped women win the constitutional right to vote in 1920. The 1920s and 30s also were important periods in the arts. George Gershwin wrote his Rhapsody in Blue, originally for piano and jazz band. It later went on to become a symphony concert favorite. Writers like Ernest Hemingway, William Faulkner, Eugene O'Neill, and others made this what many called the golden age of American writing. Frank Lloyd Wright and other architects designed great buildings for American cities. Film actors like Clark Gable and radio entertainers like Jack Benny did more than make Americans laugh or cry. They also helped unite the country. Millions of Americans could watch or listen to the same show at the same time. Politics, the economy, social traditions, art. All these changed for Americans during the 1920s and 30s. And many of these changes also had effects in countries beyond America's borders. However, the change that had the most meaning for the rest of the world was the change produced by the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. America's modern history as a great superpower begins with its reaction to that attack. It was a sudden event in the flow of history. It was a day on which a young land suddenly became fully grown. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.